Hello, welcome back. Okay, so we will continue our lecture on the recurrent neural network today. So let's have a brief review of the previous contents. So we use a more uh, sophisticated example of language model to uh, give an example of how recurrent neural network can be used in sequential modeling. So uh, as we see that the, uh, actually the mechanisms of how the previous, the, the information in the previous word are carried on to the next word is uh, very straightforward because the words at the time step, for example, in this case, in the time step zero, is encoded into the hidden layer or into the activation of time step one, which is A1. And that A1 is further used in the computation of A2 and the outputs at time step two. So in this, in this way, the older information are uh, carried on within the time sequence. So uh, eventually the, uh, the, all the information at all uh, time steps are kind of condensed or aggregated into one um, um, representation. So the section today that we're gonna cover is a special type of <clears throat> uh, recurrence neural network, or I wouldn't say special type, but it's a more uh, sophic sophisticated uh, um, neural, uh, recurrent neural network. And it, it is actually um, a common standard now. So uh, when we talk about, now, nowadays when we talk about recurrent neural network, we seldom refer to the plain neural network or vanilla neural network, vanilla recurrent neural network that we covered previously but we are basically talking about the neural network uh, structures that have gated units, like long short-term memory units or the ga simple gated recurrent units, GRU, okay? And other than these gated units, we also talk about the bidirectional uh, recurrent neural network and the deep RN or the so-called multi-layer, multiple layer recurrent neural network, okay? So let's look at, first look at why we need uh, such a gated units. And basically the challenge, the, the purpose is to uh, tackle the challenge of capturing long-term dependencies. So in terms of, uh, the language, uh, we want to use the language as an example to show why long-term dependency matters, okay? So considering a basic RNN, okay? If we want to use a basic RNN, which we used before in the previous lecture to capture the long-term dependency, it basically doesn't work well, okay? So for example, in the sentence, a pretty long sentence that has a clause in it, the cat which already ate and comma, then comes the word, the verb for the subject cat, right? So when we say such a long sentence, we basically need to memorize what our, what the subject is. And we need to use that subject to determine the forms of the verbs used here. If it's one cat, then it is was, right? If it's two cats or plural forms, then we need to use a different um, form of the, of the verb. So this is the so-called long-term dependency because the clause here, they are processed, but we don't want the information within the clause to overwhelm the information about the subjects. Okay, we want the model, a good model should still remember that the subject is a plural form or not. Okay, so that the correct verb is uh, selected or chosen, okay. But a vanilla network is not doing well in such a task 
it basically tends to uh, forget what the previous, what the, um, the subject at the beginning is, okay? Another example here, Gandalf was one of the most powerful wizard who, and after a class, we want the model to still remember that this uh, pronounce refers to the subject that appeared in the first word of the sentence. Okay, so that the correct pronouns are used. Okay, so all these tasks require very accurate memory of the previous information of a very long term uh, of, of the words that very long distance apart. Okay, so how do we uh, uh, so first let's look at why the basic network, the basic recurrent network, it doesn't do well in such a, <clears throat> um, in such a long-term dependency uh, problems because the, the, the basic uh, reason is the vanish ingredients issue. Okay, we, we have uh, first uh, came across this uh, term vanish ingredients when we first talk about deep uh, neural network, regular deep neural network. And in this case, the RN also have such an issue, okay? So because the computation of the current output, say in time step four, it heavily relies on the <clears throat> activations from the previous time step, okay? And also in the backward step, the gradients of the previous time steps is basically the multiplication of a bunch of gradients in the future steps. Like in this case, the gradients for W and U computed at time step four is such a form, okay? And these gradients will be further back propagated to one more time step back. And as you can see that the gradients for W and U at one more time step back is have, have a much uh, complex, more complex forms because it needs to consider the activations, not just at time step four, but also time step three. Okay. And that means the more we go back, um, along the time uh, scale, along the time, uh, or go backwards, the more multiplications or the more computation will be needed in computing the gradients for that particular time step, okay? So <clears throat> the DW and DUs in earlier steps, they require more computations and it's, in nature, these computations are a combination of multiplications. So we multiply a lot of vectors, a lot of tensors together. So the direct outcome of multiplying a lot of things together is that they are very sensitive to the values. So if the values are under one, like between zero and one, then if we multiply a lot of numbers together, then the resulting uh, product is a very smaller, is a very small value, right? So indicated by the shallower and the shallower colors of the gradients, the gradients at previous time steps, they have much, much less weights or much, much less values. So the small gradients means that the previous time step has very little effect on the gradients of W, okay? So let me say that again. The gradients <clears throat> is the, is basically how much we need to change the parameters, right? So the gradients here at time step two is determined, is partially determined by, is associated with the activations at time step one, right? and the gradients at time step three is associated with time step two. So, but the weights here are different, okay? Longer the equations, then the more likely these weights are becoming, uh, the, the, the less weights 
the less magnitudes these longer equations are likely to have. So that means the coefficients, so this box for before the term A0 is likely to have a much smaller value because it's a very long product, right? It's a very long uh, chain of products. So that means the gradients resulting from A0 tends to be much smaller, okay? And in another word, A0 has a much less effect on how much we need to change W, okay? <clears throat> so that is basically the results, the outcome of the vanishing gradients. And we can see that the influence from the earlier words are much smaller on the current word, okay? So if we trace back in history, within the current sentence, the most nearby words are more influential or more um, determinant to the current output. But the earlier words, um, words tend to play a less roles, which is unwanted, right? Because this is not the uh, principle of natural language. In natural language, we sometimes will put very important words at the beginning. Like I will say the subject Gandalf as my first word, but that word should always play an important role within the whole sentence. But if we use a vanilla neural network to modeling such a, a language generation process, then it will forget about the, the, the influence from the first word will will uh, diminish or decrease gradually because the gradients are <clears throat> uh, vanishing, okay? So <clears throat> the regular recurrence neural network is very <clears throat> difficult to, to capture such a long range dependency. And because we mentioned vanishing gradients, uh, the other opposite end is the exploding gradients we just uh, mentioned here since it is also sometimes quite often <clears throat> in um, in training a recurrent neural network because the gradients uh, as a result of a multiplication it can it can be very big so in training in the process of training a natural uh, recurrent neural network we often need to manually set a, a maximum limits on the gradients which is called the gradient clipping, okay? So this is just a, um, just want to mention here because it, it, it is another uh, extreme case as compared to vanishing gradients, but both vanishing gradients and exploding gradients are the issues that we want to avoid, okay? All right, now let's see, how do we address the uh, vanishing gradient issue, okay? And that will help us to capture the long range, long distance uh, dependency, okay? So we, people propose gated recurrent units and long short-term memory units, LSTM, to uh, handle such an issue. So as compared to the basic RN units, let's look at, use some computation graph to describe what's happening within the units of a, a basic recurrent unit. Right? We will need to use the activations from the previous time step and the inputs for the current time step in one computation step, right? So the activations <clears throat> at the current step is the results of uh, using the previous information, current inputs, multiply with the weight matrix and feed into a, an activation function, okay? So that's how we compute the uh, activations for the current time step, AT, and the outputs for the current time step, Y hat T, okay, uh, from a softmax layer. So this is the basic unit, okay? So this is no different from all the previous content. So <clears throat> we wanna show some different mechanisms. So instead of computing the activations, we will use some, uh, New, act, new hidden layer representation called memory cell, okay? So we use C instead of A. So this memory cell is used to keep the long-term memory, 
So such as the cats versus cats and the subject Gandalf at the beginning. So C is also a vector. Uh, it will be used to keep the long-term memory. And we, not, we do not use A, but we use C. But the, the way that the C is calculated is much more, is more complex than the way A is calculated, okay? So uh, we've, the GRU model we show here is a simplified model. It's a bit different from the original uh, proposal in the papers that I listed here. Okay, but the thought is generally the same. All right, so the trick is that at each time step, before we update the memory cell, we will first um, compute some candidates, C tilde. Okay, so we use this C tilde to indicate the candidates, okay? So the candidates, the way that the candidates is computed is similar to the way that the activations is previously computed in the basic RNN. So the candidates is the results of, uh, of using the previous memory cell, the current inputs, uh, time sum weight matrix, feeding to a 10 H activation. Okay, so this is the tilde, C tilde, the candidates. All right, but then we need to consider how much we want to use C tilde in updating, in actually updating the memory cell. We are not immediately updating the memory cell because we want to decide within the memory cell how much we want to keep, how much we want to uh, replace. Okay, we want the model to consider this fact. Okay, so we will define some gates uh, called um, gamma u. Okay, so this u is for updates. Okay, so this gamma is the results of using the previous memory cell with the current inputs uh, times some weights w u. So this update weight is different from this candidate weight, okay? So this WC is different from uh, this WU. This WU is used to, cons uh, to compute the gate, the update gate gamma, okay? So because this is a sigmoid activation function that we use here, the gamma should be between zero and one, okay? And in actually, in fact, the, uh, in practice, the, the outputs, the, the, the values for gamma is usually either zero or one, okay? Uh, it's more like a discrete, but uh, in, in theory, it is still an output from the sigmoid. Uh, but since a sigmoid function really satisf uh, uh, it becomes saturated really fast, so it al always uh, demonstrates some uh, zero versus one uh, distribution, okay? And yeah, that's the gamma gates, okay? And then now we will decide the rule for uh, updating the, the memory, memory cell C. So the new memory cell CT is the weighted summation of the candidate C tilde. Let me use a different color. The, the candidate C tilde and the previous value C T minus one, okay? So the weights for these two components is decided by the gamma that we pre-computed in the, in the previous step, okay? The gamma U decide how much weight we want to rely on the current candidate C tilde and one minus gamma is the weight that we want to keep in the memory, okay? So the C will be computed in such a way. And the stars here indicate that these are element-wise products, not um, um, like dot products, okay? So the gamma itself is a, also a vector. And uh, most of the elements are zeros or ones, okay? So the, if the gamma U is one, that means we want to update the memory cell. 
right? Because gamma equals one means that we need to rely on the new uh, candidates. And uh, this term will become zero. And that means we do not remember the memories at all. But if gamma is zero, then the new candidates will not be used at all. That means we don't want to use the current new information, but we want to stick to the old memory because one minus u, uh, one minus zero is one. Okay, so this interesting dynamic process actually enables the model to automatically uh, to have a choice, to have an option, right? It can choose to rely some rely on some uh, old memory or to rely on the current new candidates. So this is a great flexibility uh, provided to the model, okay? So for, in, for example, uh, <clears throat> in this case, uh, let's say uh, the, sentence, the sentence is the cat which already ate, right? We want to generate this sentence. And we assume that the memory cell C indicate actually encoded the whether the subject is a singular or plural font. Okay, let's assume that C equals one uh, stands for a singular subject. And so in the next word, we're probably gonna see that the updates for uh, the next time step when we uh, generates the word which the 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 uh, content cell is not updated okay because we haven't generated the verb yet and the next when we generate the word already then the update is still zero because we don't want to wipe the memory about the single uh, the singular uh, subject so eight we still keep the information no updates so until the verb was is generated, then that means the information in the subject word is already used, then we can probably forget the information and then updates the uh, content memory uh, in the content cell, okay? So after the, only after the verb uh, was is produced, then we can update the contents uh, cell, the, the, the memory cell. So actually this is just a, a arbitrary uh, demonstration. And uh, in practice, no one actually can tell in a very clear style that what's uh, specifically, what's uh, explicitly in, in encoded into those memory cells. All we need to know is that the memory cells contain is a, is, is a mixture of all the previous information, okay? It contains history information and the model needs to decide when to update the information or when to uh, <clears throat> keep those information. So that's the gated recurrent unit, GRU. So if we look at the computation graph and then we compare it with a basic RN, it's much more, uh, it's a bit more complex. And so what's passed between time steps is the memory cell, not the activations, okay? But they're kind of equivalent to the activations we used before. And before we compute the uh, new memory cell for the current contents, for the current time step, we need to compute some uh, tilde, right? So that's the additional step. We will need to compute the tilde here using the previous memory cell and the current input. And also we need to compute a gate, right? The gate is coming from a sigmoid function. And then we combine the candidates and the gates when we compute the new actual uh, memory cell. And the output step is the same as the, as the uh, basic RNN. Okay. So we listed the uh, formulas here and the black square means the uh, step that we use the weighted summation to compute the new uh, memory cell. Okay. All right. So um, 
because we um, provide such an option that the memory cell can be uh, directly passed uh, without, without doing any updates, right? So if the updates is, update gate is zero, then we need to, we don't have this term, then the memory cell is directly passed to the previous, uh, is, is almost a direct copy of the previous contents. So that means the gradients can directly pass in a backward style. Right, the gradients for the current C is directly passed to the previous uh, C without needing to uh, multiply with some weight matrix. So that allows a very uh, much less loss in the uh, magnitude of gradients. So it kind of avoids the vanishing gradients issue. All right, so. Uh, if we look at the original uh, full implementation of the GRU, it also uh, contains another weight, another gate, which is the uh, gamma R, okay? In, uh, other than the gamma U, other than the update gate, it contains the gamma R. And the gamma R is for relevance. So it basically determines how relevant the previous memory is in determining the C tilde, the candidates. So this extra step is more uh, kind of a sophisticated design because it uh, wants to want the model to be more uh, precise in deciding which, uh, how much history information they want to use in determining the current candidates. So of course it comes with more parameters and more complex computation, but uh, the thoughts in keeping uh, the information, the history information and not updating the history information all at once, but use a gate, use a uh, update gate to control how much we want to keep is basically the same as the simplified version of this model. Okay, so if you're interested, you can go ahead and look at this uh, to read this post, it provides pretty detailed uh, introduction to how the original paper implements uh, GRU unit. Alrighty, now let's look at a more famous example, which is long short-term memory LSTM. So uh, it's a, a very highly cited uh, research paper. And it actually, the very original paper comes in 1990s and uh, limited by the computation power, computation resource at that time, this model doesn't apply to a lot of cases at the beginning, but as the more powerful computers we have, we have GPUs to handle quick computation and it's getting faster and faster in modeling recurrent units, then this kind of long short term LSTM units is becoming more and more broadly used. So still, nowadays it still remain a very strong baseline models, even though we have, uh, we have huge models that have billions of parameters. This long short term memory is still kind of a uh, uh, baseline model that's worth trying, okay? So the idea uh, which Differentiate LSTM with GRU is that we separate the memory cell with the activation. Okay, we think so. The it should be two parts: the memory should be memory, and the activation should be the activation. And uh, this is different from the GRU. So we need to still consider the candidates, compute the candidates for the memory cell. Right, we need to compute the C tilde, but this C tilde is not from the previous C, but it is from the previous activation in combination, in combination with the current input, right? We use a C gate to compute the C tilde. Okay, so this is the, uh, where the difference uh, happens. And in computing the update gates, 
we also rely on the activation, but not the C itself. We use the update, update weight to compute the, and, and the activation at the previous time step to compute the update gate. And next, we'll need to compute a second gate, which is uh, plays the opposite role as the update gate. It is called the forget gate, okay? It, as the name indicates, it, it decides how much proportion within the memory we want to forget, right? So it is computed with a different gate matrix, a uh, gate weight, WF, also using the activations from the previous time step. Okay, so having these two gates together, we also need to consider the output gates. The output gates is for computing the outputs for the next, uh, for the current uh, uh, activation. Okay, the output gates here. Okay, so as we can see that the activations from the previous time step is used, but not the memory directly. Okay, so next the new content the new memory content the memory cell will be computed basically by combining uh, the weighted summation from the tilde and the previous con the previous memory cell but this time this is not one minus gamma u but gamma forget okay and uh, it basically relies more uh, flexible uh, a more flexible range for the values of memory cell C, right? It can decide the, the how much we update and how much uh, we forget becomes less coupled, okay? We can, th these two weights are less uh, related with each other. So previously we must, if we have 50% to update, then we must uh, uh, keep the 50% of the previous uh, of the information. But now if, gamma is like 50%, the, uh, the forget can also be very small value like 0.1 because the gamma and the update gates and the forget gates, they are not directly related, okay? So it gives more flexibility in, in the model's uh, ability to handle, to, to utilize previous, uh, to utilize uh, the history information, okay? So that is how CT is computed. So remember, we still have the output gates. The output gates is used to control the current activation, okay? The current activation is the result of applying some 10H activation upon the newly computed memory cell, and then uh, element-wise multiply with the output gates, okay? So it makes things more complicated. It uh, separates the memory and the activation. So by this, we are basically separating the memory into two parts. The first part is the long-term memory, which is stored in the <coughs> cell C. And the short-term memory is stored in the activation A. So by separating these parts, we are uh, kind of given the model such a power that the memories for the long-term dependencies, they don't interfere with the memories for the short-term uh, dependencies, okay? Because when we generate, when we produce the next word, we need to consider multiple facts. Like the, my next word can be related to the immediate previous word, but it can also be related to the, uh, my very first word, right? So there's these two kinds of dependencies. And having these two activations, the C and the A, will allow such a language model to utilize the different parts of the memory uh, separately, okay? Which basically is a more, uh, provides a rich, much more richer uh, expression than the uh, simple GRU units, okay? So if we compare with GRU units, uh, we have one more gate, Right in GRU we have update gates and the relevance gates, and the way that GRU computes updates the content the memory cell is 
gamma u versus one minus gamma u, but here we let gamma u versus gamma f, which is mo one more uh, gates uh, parameters. Okay, so uh, generally speaking, LSTM is a, a more complex model than GRU, and as a result, it typically works better in most uh, tasks uh, than GRU. Uh, but uh, nowadays, still the, the modern frameworks they can they contain uh, they uh, keep uh, both uh, LSTM and the GRU as basic units as basic uh, building blocks. And as I said, LSTM is uh, is uh, more often used as a baseline models. Okay, so with no specific reasons, people usually like consider LSTM as the default. Uh, uh, basic model, baseline model to handle uh, sequential data, to model sequential data. So similar to the GRU, uh, we can look at the computation graphs here. So we have two lines. So that is the major difference from G, uh, between LSTM and the GRU. There are two lines or two data flows that are passed along time steps. The, the upper line, the upper pipe is for the long-term memory and the lower pipe is for the short-term memories, okay? So there are three gates computed here, the forgetting gates, the update gates, the output gates. So these gates are, are used to control how, the, uh, uh, how much the content, the memory content should be um, updated and how much uh, the active, the shorter memory activation should be computed. Okay. All right. So maybe one more technical detail is that the activation, the output here is computed using the activations, but not from the content directly. Okay. But the activation itself also partially relies on the previous content. As you can see, we had a flow from here, right? So both long-term memory and the short-term memory are used in compute the uh, outputs at this time step. All right. So we can uh, handle um, are modeling the long-term dependencies or long-range dependencies uh, with quite decent performance using such a uh, uh, gated units enabled recurrence units like LSTM or GRU. And it can provide a very significant boost in performance in terms of language modeling and in terms of in tasks like natural language generation, okay? All right, so uh, there's an interesting quote in the original paper uh, from the authors of LSTM that, that explaining where the term long shot of memory is from. And I think it's, uh, 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 it has some quite uh, deep, uh, sophistical uh, uh, philosophy uh, meanings in it, like, uh, it basically it separates the representations from the recent events uh, as opposed to the long-term memory uh, encoded uh, in another in, in a separate representation. So uh, if you have time, I think it's worth uh, reading the original paper. Um, it is written in a very mathematical style. But I think that some discussions in that paper is uh, quite uh, insightful. All right. So having such an LSTM basic unit we have designed, then we can put it into a network by connecting different time steps. So uh, in the compact, uh, realization or representation of the model, we don't need to always uh, show how the internal structure looks like, unless you have some changes to the, how the gates are different, are, are, are designed in a different way. 
So when LSTM is first applied to language model, people have multiple, people have contributed a lot of different diverse uh, design ideas for how to handle the, how to design the gates, how to update the activations. So there were all different types of variants of LSTM. But uh, nowadays, I think we just uh, can start with the defaults, the standard uh, implementations that's provided in most uh, uh, frameworks like PyTorch or TensorFlow, okay? So if we hide the units, then the LSTM model is quite similar to the uh, basic RNN model. Because if we don't look at the internal structure, we just uh, notice the difference is that there are two uh, data flows in uh, between time step, but in basic RN, there's only one flow. All right. So using this simplified visualization, we can plot uh, RN based models in a much more easier way. For example, if we uh, use basic RN blocks, RN building blocks, we can just use an activation inside the box, right? If we use LSTM basic block, then we can just put LSTM here, indicating that there are a lot of gates computation happening within the box here. And same to GRU, we just put the name within the box saying that this is a gated unit, okay? But so the overall architecture doesn't change. In nature, these are just uh, recurrent neural network models. All right, so, Next, let's enter the next topic, which is the uh, bi-directional recurrent neural network, okay? So the main major motivation is that when we're modeling sequential data, for example, language, sometimes using only the past information is not sufficient. I'm gonna show the example that we have showed in the first lecture a week ago, right? For example, in this sentence, Teddy Roosevelt was a great president or teddy bears are on sale. So only reading the first two words, like he said, will not help us to decide whether the word teddy is part of a president's name or part of a teddy bear, teddy bear's name. So the meaning of teddy is not decided, is not fully decided by the uh, first two inputs. Okay, and actually, after we read the word Roosevelt, the last name, and the next word, the great president, then we are more sure that Teddy should be the president's name, right? So that means the information in the past and the future, they need to be combined in determining the meanings of the word. So that leads to the thought of designing the so-called bi-directional RNA, okay? So we can have more than one direction. So if it's just one direction, single direction, then we'll have the activations computed in this way, right? That's for the first time step. <clears throat> and then A1 will be used to compute A2, and A2 will be uh, computed to, will be used to compute A3, and A3 will be fed to A4. So that's one forward direction, okay? And then we'll need a way back, okay? After A4 is computed, we will use A4 to compute a new activation here, which goes back to A3 and the new A3. So the difference is that the arrows here, the arrows in the forward pass is pointing from left to right and the arrows above A is from right to left. So indicating that these these are two different activations, okay? So for each time step, we have two activations. One indicates the forward direction, the other indicates the backward direction, okay? We have A3 backward to A2 backward and A1 backward. And then we will need to use both the activations from both directions to compute the output for the uh, in this case, we want to compute the prediction of whether a word is uh, part of a, a people's a person's name, right? So when we compute outputs, we need to notice that okay, we're not just we are using two activations, uh, 
uh, appended to each other, not just the a forward, but also a, a backward. All right. So since we have some uh, ambiguity in the backward, we use the backward in backward propagation, right? That's the algorithm for training a network. But this time, the in this case, the backward direction doesn't mean backward propagation. So the backward direction for network is still the forward. It's still the forward uh, path of network. Okay, it's not the uh, backward propagation algorithm that we are talking about here. All right. And next, we can look at a more sophisticated design for RN, which is multiple layer or the so-called deep RN network. Okay, so uh, uh, it draws some um, uh, inspirations from the regular deep network, which is not recurrence. For example, we just uh, stack all the parameters upon one layer, right? One layer upon each other. So. In the, uh, <clears throat> in the case of recurrency units, you know, the recurrence network, we can also do the same thing. For example, we use uh, the one in the brackets, square brackets to indicate that this is the layer one. And then we take the activations from the first layer to feed into the second layer. A2, right? So the activations will be used as a time step for the second layer of network, okay? So it's like we treat these intermediate hidden activations A1 as a new sequence. And we use that hidden information to feed into a different uh, network called A2. Okay, the A2, can also be fit into a second, a third layer, okay? So <clears throat> in theory, this can infinitely stack, but so we, in practice, we don't always, we don't often go beyond the three layers. And for example, in this unit, the A2 of uh, at time step three is actually the result of using A2 at time step two, which is to the left, and the A1 at time step three, which is the inputs for the current layer. Okay, so these two units is computed in, is used in, in, in computing A2, three. So the uh, advantage of such a deep model is that we can uh, give more, uh, first of all, it, it, it comes with more parameters, right? So more parameters means that <clears throat> more expressiveness uh, of the model. We can represent the inputs with more than one layer, which means we can learn more higher, uh, higher level uh, patterns within the sequence, okay? So if we combine the multiple layer design with the bi-directional design, we will have some, something very uh, complex like the hybrid uh, model, which is multiple layer and also bi-directional, right? So for example, in these layers, we have uh, the second layer will be a different direction and the fourth layer will be from right to left as well. And the first layer is from left to right and the third layer is from left to right as well, okay? So these hybrid speech, like these hybrid models, they're very, they were very popular uh, at the beginning, like uh, in early days. Uh, but nowadays, this type of hybrid models, they are kind of being replaced by transformer-based models. And transformer-based model is uh, non-recurrence, uh, but we will uh, introduce that in a, in a, in a new selected topic uh, lecture uh, later uh, at the end of this semester, okay? So uh, in this particular uh, graph that I show here, we placed one layer of bidirectional uh, model. So we can think of this thing as a bidirectional layer, right? We can think of it as one layer and the next one as also uh, as a second layer. And there are some skip connections between the layers, 
All right. So we have some time left. Then let's continue the uh, lecture and uh, cover the rest of the slides. So uh, when we give, uh, uh, define a RM model using a modern framework, it's very straightforward. Like we can use the model to, we can define a uh, RM based classification model that tells whether the name is uh, uh, the nationality of a name, like which name types are uh, given a, a sequence of characters. Okay, so the model, if we want to design is a basic RN, then we can use the building blocks provided by PyTorch, like we can set the hidden representations and the input representations and then feed the hidden to the next time step, like manually. And if we look at the code, it'll be something like this. We use the end on module, right? Remember the end on module that we use when we just define the deep uh, neural network based model and the CN models. So we can define the uh, input to hidden weights as a linear uh, parameter, as a linear weight matrix, and the input to output as another linear uh, weight. Okay. Also, the softmax is uh, where we connect to the output. Okay. So, given the input, we basically want to first combine the hidden with the input because the forward function needs to take not just the current input, but also the previous input. So this hidden is from the previous time step, okay? So all we need to do is to combine the current input and the previous hidden units and the feed into the uh, input to hidden uh, uh, weight matrix. And this, here comes the new hidden, okay? And uh, again, we will need to return the outputs and the hidden. So uh, in theory, because RN, the basic RN can be built up in this way, that means the LSTM models can also be built up in such a style. But uh, in practice, we don't need to do this manually in PyTorch because PyTorch provides a much more easier way uh, to uh, uh, represent the, uh, to, to, to model the, a, to implement a uh, RN based models with more, uh, uh, much more sophisticated uh, modules. So you will find the models like LSTM that is directly already implemented. And all you need to do is to use LSTM as a model and uh, inputs, the input to an LSTM model is a sequence. Okay, you, you just, you don't need to like take each time step out and feed the, each time step to a model uh, using a for loop. All right. And another thing about training a network in PyTorch is that everything needs to be represented in a tensor. And so is the, so is the uh, linear, uh, so is the word representations. So we know that a word needs to be uh, represented by a one hot encoding which is a long vector that with a lot of zeros and only one one in, in some position, right? So that indicates some tricks of handling the, the inputs, converting the inputs into some uh, very long matrix, uh, very long tensors with just, with just one, uh, activation with just one non-zero elements. And we will see that this can be automatically done by PyTorch. And the training process for the new recurrent neural network model is basically the same as the uh, a regular model or a regular neural network model or a CM based model. So you basically define the loss function, right? And then call the backward and then update the uh, gradients. So here we didn't use a, a an, an optimizer, but in practice we often use an optimizer instead of doing the upgrades, uh, doing the gradients updates manually. Okay. All right. 
Uh, so I extend the video. So uh, today's contents uh, uh, is all done. And uh, we are basically done with the chapter for uh, recurrent neural network models. And I will release uh, the homework, the assignments for RNN today. And then you can start working on that. And uh, it's similar to the way that the CNN-based CNN models are designed. So we will implement some uh, backwards, uh, some uh, forward and backwards uh, in a, within NumPy implementation. And then we will uh, try to call some PyTorch-based models for a, uh, for a more realistic tasks. All right, so that's pretty much all of it today. And uh, if you have questions, let me know. And you can send me emails and uh, also coming in, in uh, office hour. All right, looks like we don't have questions today. Thank you. And uh, see you on this Thursday. So we will start a new uh, topic, but it's quite related to the recurrence neural network. We will talk about word embeddings or embedding models, which is common technique in sequential modeling.